Greetings to all my tech heads out there in the Kev Techify Nation, and if you're new here, welcome. In this episode, we're going to look at OSPF operation. We'll be discussing OSPF operational states, establishing neighbor adjacencies, synchronizing OSPF databases, the need for a DR, LSA flooding with a DR. This episode is part of my series on enterprise networking, security, and automation. I'm Kevin here at Kev Techify. Let's get this adventure started. As we look at OSPF, as it comes on and starts establishing it on, on, on your network, it goes through seven different states. It goes through a process of starting online, not knowing anything to a full state of knowing all the states of all the links in our entire network that allows us to make the best path across the network. These seven states are sort of a transitional and they go from one to the other. The down state where we start goes into the init state or the initialization state. That then leads to the two-way state, which leads to the X start state which leads to the exchange state, then to the loading state. And then finally, after all the information is shared in that link state database is fully synchronized, we are in the full state. When we start a discussion about OSPF operation, we need to look at when you start. When you start and you activate OSPF on an interface, it's in the down state. Your OSPF router, that OSPF interface, must establish if there's another OSPF router on that interface on that link. When we're in this down state, we're going to send out a hello packet. When we send out that hello packet, we're now in the init state, the initialization state. We're going to say, hello, this is my router ID. Is there another OSPF device out there? And this is sent to a multicast address of 224.0.0.5. Any device running OSPF is listening to that multicast address and will hear this multicast message being sent out. Most of the time, when we say router ID, you can think of that's the IP address on the interface that OSPF is activated with. When we get a hello message back, we're still going to stay in this init state because we've seen that there is somebody else on this OSPF activated link. When router 2 sends that hello message back to R1, R2 is also going to add in that the neighbor is 172.16.5.1 on this OSPF activated link. And it'll also note what interface this is on. This is on interface gig01. When R2 sends this hello message back to us, it's going to be sending it to our IP address. It's going to be a unicast message directed right towards us. When R1 gets this hello message back from R2, it's going to see itself in the neighbor list. And when it sees itself in the neighbor list, R1 is going to transition into that two-way state. R1 has received a hello from R2. And in that hello, it includes R2's neighbors, which also includes R1. And since we see that our own router ID in R2's neighbor list, this transitions us to that two-way state. Now, in this two-way state, we have to talk about this elect election that's going to occur. And this election is for a DR, designated router, and a BDR, backup designated router. This election only occurs on multi-access networks like Ethernet. In this election, our routers are going to have a default priority of one on their links, and because both of them are defaulted at one, it is a tie. And the tiebreaker goes to what is known as the highest router ID. 
and the router ID is typically the IP address of the interface. Router 1 has a router ID of 172.16.5.1 and router 2 has a router ID of 172.16.5.2. Last octets are different. One is a dot one, one is a dot two. Because R2 has the higher IP address, R2 will become the designated router, the DR. R1 has a lower router ID, but it's also the second highest router ID that will become the BDR, the backup designated router. Our routers move onward from that election in that two-way state. And they're gonna go on to what is known as the synchronizing database process for the OSPF. What we're focusing on here is synchronizing their link state databases, their LSDBs, which is really the topology table. And to start the synchronization process, we use the X start state. And in the X start state, which is the exchange start state, we have the routers choosing who is going to share their link state database first. The link state database is known as that DBD packet, which is a summarization of that database. And in that exchange start state, the two routers will pick out who goes first and then R2 says, I have the highest router ID, so I'm going to send my database description packet over to R1 first. If you like this episode on OSPF operation and you get value out of it, and depending upon the platform you're using, please click that like button, give a five-star rating, leave a comment. Doing this supports the channel, which in turn helps me bring you more great content. Subscribe to my channel and click that notification bell. You can also visit my website at kevtechify.com where you can get all of these episodes in video and podcast form. And remember, the DBD is a summary of that link state database. So it sends that summary over from R2 to R1. R1 then sends a link state acknowledgement back and says, thank you for that information. Then R1 will send its summary of its link state database, that DBD, from R1 to R2. R2 will send an acknowledgement saying, thank you for sending that over. After we have viewed our database description packet, the routers will then respond back to each other with link state requests, LSRs, and link state updates, LSU. In the LSR, we're gonna ask for more specific information on different entries in our DBD. The other router that receives that request will respond accordingly with an LSU, which is a link state update. And then the originating router will respond with a link state acknowledgement because OSPF likes to be reliable. After all of these LSRs and LSUs, we have reached full convergence. When we have this DR and BDR relationship coming into play and the two-way state, why is this important? What we have is multi-access networks. Multi-access networks are common when we have ethernet connectivity. And in this case, we have four routers with a switch interconnecting them. This is going to create multiple adjacencies. What we have here is every router has an adjacency with every other router. What this means is every router is making sure it has a fully converged state with every other of the three routers. When the number of routers increase, the number of adjacencies increase almost ex exponentially. Here we have four routers. They have six adjacencies. They have a, each router has three connections, one connection to every other router. 
If we increase that number to five routers, we go from a total of six adjacencies up to 10 adjacencies. Each router now maintains four adjacencies, one to every other router, and it just continues to grow. And the more routers you put on the network, the more adjacencies. And the reason this is bad is with every adjacency, the link state advertisements all have to go out to make sure we have this convergence. We have to send out lots and lots of link state adver announcements to make sure we have this fully converged network. Let's walk through an example. Let's say router two has a change. It has a change. And so what we have to do is send out link state announcements. R2 sends a LSA to every other router. What that means is R2 sends an LSA to R1. R2 sends an LSA to R5. R2 sends an LSA to R4. And R2 sends an LSA to R3. That is four LSAs that transferred our network. And then those routers, they do their work. And each one of those routers then send out LSAs to all the other routers. That means R3 sends one to R2. R3 sends one to R4. R3 sends one to R5. R3 sends one to R4. Then R4 sends all their information out. It goes from R3. R4 to R3, R4 to R2, R4 to R1, R4 to R5. R5 does the same thing. So R5 to R4, R5 to R3, R5 to R2, R5 to R1. And last but not least, R1 does the same thing. So R1 to R2, R1 to R3, R1 to R4, and R1 to R5. Look at all those LSAs that have to travel all across our network. Now, OSPF is doing it correctly. OSPF is doing its job, but look at all of those excessive LSAs that have to travel across our network. We can reach full convergence when we use our designated router and our backup designated router. By just using our DR and our BR, we can have a full state, full convergence with a lot less LSAs traveling across our network. When we have the DR and BR, router one, router four, and router five, they'll only have a two-way state with each other. They won't concern themselves with having the exact same topology table as each other router. Let's see what happens. R1 has a change. I'm going to go ahead and put that down here. It has a change. It sends out LSAs, but it only sends out LSAs to the designated router and the backup designated router to R2 and R3. And then only the DR sends out LSAs to all the routers so R, R2 sends an LSA to R1, R2 to R5, R2 to R4, and R2 to R3. And then the other routers don't have to notify each other. And routers 4 and 5, they don't have to notify each other because they only have a two-way state. But all the routers have a full state with the DR and the BDR. It was my pleasure to provide you with this wonderful episode on OSPF operation. If you like this episode and you got value out of it, and of course, depending upon what platform you're using, please click that like button, give a five-star rating, leave a comment. This all helps me bring you more great content. Please take a minute to subscribe to my channel. All of my socials and contact information are on my website, kevtechify.com. You can get all these episodes in video and podcast form. In the upper right is my playlist for my series on enterprise networking, security, and automation. In the bottom right is one of my favorite videos that I linked just for you. Thank you so much for watching this episode of my series on enterprise networking, security, and automation. Once again, I'm Kevin. 
This is Kev Techify. I'll see you next time for another great adventure.